This week, Mick Lynch has been owning the media establishment, and he's not done yet. I want you to confirm or deny if this is your Facebook page. It's a picture yeah, of, Can you a see picture the of a hood from Thunderbirds. Can you see the likeness? Well, I'm just wondering where the comparison goes, because he was obviously <laughs> an evil criminal terrorist mastermind uh, described as the world's most dangerous man who wreaked utter, that the, is utter that the level you're pitching this at, uh, on the public. Is that the level you're pitching this at, Piers? That is a joke amongst me and my friends, and you can see the likeness, if you like. So He's you're not denying that you are eyebrows. comparing yourself to the hood? I'm not comparing myself to anyone. I'm me. You've literally made your profile picture the hood. And I'm simply well, saying, I was so a massive... What? If it was a bunch I was of a flowers, Thunderbirds fan, and if the if hood was, was the most was dangerous, flowers, would I be evil a person in the world. He's the most evil puppet made out of vinyl in the world. Is that the level your journalism's at these days? I simply asked you if that was you and your Facebook page. Well, do, you, do, do you think I look like the most evil person in the world, Piers? Well, now you're asking me to, to answer a difficult question, Mick. I don't know you that well. All well, I'm I don't saying think is, I am you the most have personally. Evil person in the world. I'm just I think I'm a working class bloke who's leading a trade union in a dispute over jobs, if you, pay, and conditions. I understand. If you don't want to be compared to the hood, probably better not to have the hood as your well, profile I think picture. I think it's quite funny. So do I. But I well, also like. Go. As I was a Thunderbirds fan... Is that the level fan, we're at, though? Don't you want to talk about the issues rather than a little vinyl simply, puppet from the I'm 1960s? I'm simply trying to get inside the mindset of the man about to wreak havoc on the country. It makes <sighs> me laugh. Honestly, that you have the hood as your profile pic because that's a man who wreaked havoc on the world. Well, it makes me laugh that your level of journalism has descended so far that you can't think of any other question rather than a, a thing about put, the Thunderbirds. I didn't put that picture on your profile page. Yeah, but you've chosen to spend two or three minutes of this interview talking about an irrelevant. Because you seem so but irritated by the comparison. Going. Well, because you seem so irritated by the comparison to the I'm hood. I'm not irritated at all. I'm completely. You seem very calm irritated. About it. Well, I'm not. You're not? This is your non-irritated phase, is it? <laughs> what point are you trying to prove, Piers? I mean, I'm not trying to, try to, to wind I'm me not up, trying to it's prove not anything. You, see, you put it on your Facebook page. I'm simply asking, right. it's an odd choice for a union boss okay. who's about but to go on to ask a, a series of strikes to have Piers, that as your choice. To it's important to say that Piers Morgan actually posted that clip himself as if he's proud of it. Uh, he's been talking about all the facts and figures and the you know the the massive reach it's had on social media peers it's because people are laughing at you it's not because it's a gotcha of mick lynch on itv lynch took tory mp robert jenrick to task you've lost 20 percent of the passengers on the railway since COVID. I haven't lost That's not COVID the fault did. of you and but the COVID railway. Industrial change. But we need to we encourage operated those people. the trains all through we need that to, period. We need to encourage those people back. The worst way in which you can do that is by alienating your customers, by going on strike and making their lives much more difficult. The worst way you could do it is insist that the fares go up by RPI, ripping off the commuters, but you won't give the, the workers RPI. The fares go up by RPI every year, the retail price index. That's the government regulations. Last year, profits were made by the train operators. £500 million out of that subsidy you gave went to those companies. First group and go-ahead, who we're negotiating with, are both subject to takeovers from private, private equity companies, they're going to be worth billions because they know that you're going to keep siphoning money from the public purse into private but, sector operators, well, just least, as you're but, doing but, in but, health, but what's education... What's actually happened in the care. last two years is... In effect, a large swathe of the rails have been Actually, I've got to bring in So the idea that this is siphoning profits to the private sector group made a hundred, is ridiculous. £100 million pound okay. of profit. <laughs> Important to say as well that the rail operators that uh, Mick Lynch referred to go ahead and first group. The CEOs of these organisations are on £550,000, £600,000 a year. That's before bonuses. In each organisation, you're talking dozens of people on absolute megabucks. But of course, nobody in the media wants to talk about that. If we're talking about paying conditions, it's about people on around £30,000 a year. The average RMT member has a salary of 31000 And apparently, that's too much. But Mick Lynch wasn't finished. Then there was BBC Question Time, where he took on the Transport Minister, Rachel McLean. The companies have told me, face-to-face, -face, they could achieve 
a guarantee of no compulsory redundancies. Yes, so why don't you um, negotiate with them Because on that they basis? won't write it down on a piece of paper and give it to us as the commitment. It is. But they... got... It's here. No, it's not. It I is. thought you That's didn't interfere in these negotiations. I've, I've but you've got a network letter. rail letter. I've got the network rail letter here. That does not give us... OK, none of us that can does read not it. Give us so do you want to read out the relevant bit, Rachel? Well, will you read out where well, it, it says... It doesn't say guarantee Well, look, someone read it out, for heaven's sake. Rachel, you've got it. Will you read out the relevant bit? There, we, when the changes are implemented, our need for maintenance and work delivery staff is likely to reduce. We will need to commence formal redundancy consultation yeah, with is, our trade that unions. Is compulsory no, it's not. Again, while we do not have to agree those redundancy with our trade unions, we would much prefer to implement them with your agreement and cooperation. We very much hope and anticipate that sufficient employees will volunteer for redundancy to avoid the need to make anyone compulsory redundant. So where does it That's say? your it's not a guarantee. Then, it's say there's a guarantee of no compulsory redundancy. It's very clear. Does it say no compulsory redundancy? No, of course it doesn't, because well, as the lady said, no, no organisation can give that guarantee. But you Network can see Rail here gave in, us that guarantee for 12 years on the You can see here in black and white, it says they want to do this with your agreement. And if, you, if you will negotiate you said, with them, you can That's protect the jobs of that gentleman over there. It doesn't say there. what you said it said. Well, I, what okay. I said it I said. I think we're going round. <laughs> Fiona Bruce being a, a clapping seal rather than actually trying to get to the facts of who was lying and who wasn't. I guess it was the uh, Tory minister, so of course she wouldn't. Uh, then Mick Lynch gave a brilliant account of public sector wage stagnation on that same show. There are a whole strata of people in this country that have been subjected to this form of austerity for an extended period. Uh, what is it, nearly 12 years now that have had pay suppressed. And if that's what it's about. It's about making workers cheaper for, for the government. And that can only go on for so long. And it causes disruption in the society. It causes people to be alienated from what they're doing. And, and when the must... government says, if, if, if they keep... I'm going to say this for you, Rachel, since you're sitting quiet, quiet as a mouse. If the government says, if, if we give large um, increases in, in public sector uh, uh, wages, that would drive inflation up. Well, Inflation's gone up, and the problem is that prices It'll are chasing wages. Uh, wages are chasing prices, not the other way around. We've had a lot of people, whether in the private sector or the public sector, all in small small businesses, who've not had a rise for a very, very long time, and they're starting to really feel the pinch. We've got a society where people in full-time employment are having to take state benefits, and some of them are having to go to food banks. That cannot continue. We've got care workers and other workers, not just nurses, and everybody talks about nurses, but all sorts of people in the public sector, in the councils, who I think are completely undervalued, and they've, they're starting to think, I need to stand up and get some dignity at work so I can get a better standard of living. And that means some of us that are doing better may have to give up some of what we have and transfer it to them through some kind of government mechanism, because it's not right. That means progressive tax so that people earn a decent living and have a decent living to live on. Fiona Bruce literally said out loud that she was going to interfere, make the government's case for them because the government minister wasn't doing a sufficiently good job. She cut off Mick Lynch to make the government's points for them. Not long after that, there was this audience member who had a, a pretty strange contribution, in all honesty. You absolutely have to change with the, what you experience economically. So do you think the RMT is taking the wrong approach? Yes, and look what happened to the dinosaurs. Well, they were around for a very long time. <laughs> They're not with us now, though, are million they? Years. Ash, why do people hate dinosaurs so much? They were around for so long. Kids love them. Very dangerous. <laughs> why do people hate dinosaurs so much? No, but I, I think Hyacinth Bucket makes a really good point, which is that unless the RMT accepts a real terms wage cut for its members, worse conditions and compulsory redundancies, the entirety of the human race will be wiped out by an asteroid. It's just basic economics. Do you think that point of view, that sort of paranoiac Hyacinth Bouquet sort of face that she was making, I want to speak to your manager, you know, you can imagine her going, Mr. Rex, with your small arms, I want to speak to your manager. Do you think that she's reflecting a, a real tendency in, in public life? Or do you think this is particularly amplified by shows like BBC Question Time? Well, look, you do come across people in life who appear to be the distillation of some kind of archetype. 
right? We all do that. And we're like, oh my God, did I just meet a person or a character? And in her case, she is the quintessential curtain twitcher, hyacinth bucket, the kernel of the cul-de-sac. She's the kind of person where if you kick a football over into her garden, you're getting it back with a fork, like, you know, stabbed through it. All right. She is the distillation of something that we all recognize. But the thing about question time audience selection, and I'm saying this as someone who's done three question times, is that you come across a a disproportionate number of that exact kind of person. And for some reason, you often find them in the front row. So I remember doing a question time and there was a woman in the front row. She had this very, very chunky fringe. And she started going on and on and on about how we couldn't let in any more migrants because the country was literally sinking like sinking under the weight of too many people, which is obviously totally bananas. And then after I'd had this interaction with her, it came to my attention that she was a former member of the National Front, that she's somebody who had been on, you know, free Tommy Robinson marches. And so then you've got to ask yourself, how representative of not just the country as a whole, but the constituency that the show is being filmed in is that point of view. So there's something going on, I think, in terms of the question time audience selection, which skews what you're seeing. Now, Stratford-upon-Avon, it's a very Tory seat. I don't necessarily expect it to reflect the same range of opinion as you would find, I don't know, in Tottenham or, you know, up in Manchester or somewhere in Liverpool. And that's totally legitimate. Those voices deserve an airing too. The fact is, is that these are unusually very, very popular strikes. Uh, You know, 58% of people polled said that they thought that the strikers were justified. And that is within an incredibly hostile media environment. So I think if in a week where you see Mick Lynch giving it the comms equivalent of Neo in the Matrix, just taking on, you know, presenter after presenter, batting away stupid question after stupid question. And then he's in a really hostile environment where seemingly nobody likes him. That isn't representative of the country as a whole. And we've got to ask ourselves about the role of things like question time in terms of skewing where we think public opinion is rather than accurately reflecting it. Yeah, I think that's so important. I think, for instance, about, you know, the Green Party, they've quadrupled, I think, their number of councillors in the last three, four years. They do have a member of parliament. Compare that to the coverage that UKIP was getting way before uh, the Brexit referendum. You can kind of understand it, of course, in 2016. But the Green Party now has more councillors than UKIP ever had. And yeah, I don't think they've had an appearance on BBC Question Time for like three years, three and a half years unbelievable. And I made a comment about the production company that's responsible for BBC Question Time on Twitter. It's a very right-wing company. I mean, the TV industry is is packed with reactionary right-wing people. Uh, but that particular production company, I think, has uh, quite unique problems. So I'll maybe one day make a documentary about it, you know, the truth behind BBC Question Time. 